Outrocast. Bob, how is your day going to set from answering the same questions over and over and over and over and over, and over again? I, I don't mind. Listen, whatever I can do to get the word out on the film. You know, you work on a film for a period of time, and to me, the, I measure its success by how many people get to see it. So whatever I can do to encourage people to see this movie, it, it's it's okay with me. Right. Well, I'm going to start this one off with a compliment. I've been watching your work avidly for decades. Didn't always mm -hmm. realize it was yours. So, for example, the Green Day music video for Longview, oh. very instrumental on my life. Behind the music, which you produced and edited, very quotable all these decades later. But you yourself had your own company started in the 80s. When did you kind of realize that this was going to be a path and not just something you did on weekends? Well, I've I've made a living as a film and television editor for the last 43 years. I I, I studied film in film school. I was a, a, a filmmaking brat when I was a kid. Uh, so it's something I've always done. <clears throat> and I made my living uh, working on just about every possible kind of filmmaking outside of porn. I've never had to work on porn, fortunately. But anything from commercials, industrials, you know, corporate stuff, big Hollywood movies, independent films, uh, television shows, I've done it all uh, to make a living and uh, and to learn my craft. Uh, in the late 80s, I started making uh, my own film for the first time since I was in film school. Uh, and that was a documentary about Michael Bloomfield. And had I known that it was going to take me 25 years to complete it, I probably would have never started it. But I was I, I was naive and uh, and I started working on that project. I think I was working as an assistant editor uh, on, on feature films at the same time I was doing that. Um, and then, but that was not like uh, something I, I earned a living doing or that I was doing full time. I was full time. I was working as an editor. Uh, then in the nineties, I was commuting to Los Angeles a lot, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, to work on what we now call reality television. Uh, I was editing a show called uh, uh, the real world. Yeah. Uh, during during its, its early seasons. Bunum Murray Productions. Bunum Murray Productions. I, I knew Mary Ellis Bunum and John Murray very well. Uh, and uh, one of my good buddies uh, that I worked with on that show uh, got a gig working on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. And he was producing these little films for the, for the ceremony. And when I found it, and he was calling me up because he knew that I knew a lot about music. And, and so he was asking me questions about this stuff. And I helped them out and I said, you really got to get me on this job. So the following year, which would have been 1995, <clears throat> I actually got on that show and I worked on it for many years mm -hmm. uh, and, and learned how to make music documentaries that were two to five minutes long that encapsulated a person's career. And from there, I established a relationship with uh, the Jefferson Airplanes manager, Bill Thompson, became a good friend of mine. And uh, together we, uh, uh, he encouraged me to pitch behind the music. Let's do a Jefferson Airplane about behind the music. And I was able to do that. And and that led to other projects. And then a funny thing happens is uh, after you've been doing it for a little bit, people sort of know you for that. So I sort of became known as the rock and roll uh, music documentarian, but I've done, I've done everything uh, up until then. Uh, now, you know, we'll, we'll go forward nearly 30 years I've been doing this, uh, these music documentaries. Uh, I'm at a point now where I've pretty much retired from being a freelance film and television editor. And I only work on projects that really interest me. And and what interests me still is is mostly music stuff. Although I the, my next big project uh, that I hope to finish is a documentary about um, American satirist Paul Krasner, who published The Realist and was one of the founders of the Yippies. And he was an old friend of mine. And I, I have an unfinished film about Paul that, I, that I'd like to make. So that's next on, on my, my agenda. Wow. Well, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But Born in Chicago is what we were set up to discuss. Yes. When did you actually lock this film? When was it done? We actually finished this film, I believe it was in the fall of 2020. Mm. We had come up with a first... Our, now... This film has an interesting history. It was started out as a concert film. I believe they filmed it in 2008 or 2009. And then as they started working on it, they started shooting more interviews. I wasn't involved in this. Uh, director by the name of John Anderson was. 
and they shot some interviews and they incorporated the interviews in the concert film and mm -hmm. there was a version of that film and then John left to go do other things and the film went through a number of hands but it it stayed ostensibly as a concert film with a documentary material to give it some context as to who these musicians were. Uh, the producers were never really happy with w whatever they had. And around 2016, they came to me and my filmmaking partner, Christina Keating, uh, and music uh, historian uh, and journalist, uh, Joel Selvin, and mm -hmm. asked us if we could help them, if we could fix the film. And I said, well, it, it, the film doesn't know whether it's a concert film or a historical documentary. It needs to be one or the other. It's not working as a hybrid. And they said, well, we want it to be a historical documentary. So we basically stripped the film down to its studs, went back to the original source material. Joel Selvin wrote an extensive script that became the blueprint for what Christine and I did. And she did a big deep dive in terms of getting archival footage, performances. And when I say archival footage, not just performances, but also the interstitial sort of glue uh, to give you a sense of time and place. Uh, and, and, and so that helped us uh, make a film that really sort of transports you back to this era. And we finished this film, right. our first cut, we finished in 2018, I think. Uh, and uh, at that point, they, the money people behind it uh, got a little bit of sticker shock. They kind of ran out of money and they put a pin in it. They said, well, let's sell the film first before we finish it. So we were sort of in a state of limbo where the film was creatively finished, but it wasn't technically finished because we didn't get all the master materials in and, and the rights and clearances weren't all paid for. So we couldn't do right. anything with it. And in and, and, and the fall or in the summer of 2020, uh, the producers called me up and they said, can you finish it in the next six weeks? Because we made a sale to Sky Arts, which is a, a cable outlet, a big cable outlet in Europe out mm -hmm. of the UK. And so we finished, we we actually finished the film for that release. But with the film was never sold in, in North America, they were hoping for a sale with, uh, you know, Amazon uh, or uh, Showtime or HBO or Netflix. And none of those sales came through. So the producers are now, uh, through Shout Factory, or now called Shout Studios, they're mm -hmm. doing a, a release on all these different TVOD platforms, so people will be able to stream it or download it uh, for a price, and, and it'll finally be out there. So, uh, but that's, uh, we're, we're now going almost three years after, I think, that it initially uh, aired on, on in the UK, that we're finally going to be able to uh, unleash it on, on North America and the rest of the rest of the world. Between that and the Bloomfield documentary, clearly you're a patient gentleman. <laughs> well, you, you know, uh, passion projects you need to be patient patient for because they take a long time. They're very yeah. expensive to put together. And you, and you have to, and even my Krasner film, uh, you know, I've been working on it for decades. So, you know, my, my advice for people who are, want to make documentaries is, uh, uh, get your interviews done really quickly because there's uh, attrition people people die and you want to get their stories while they're still here but uh you know be easy on yourself unless you have really deep pockets and you can just pay for this stuff it takes a while to raise the money to finish these films well said uh you know before i last ask my last question which is related to this in writing the book that's coming out in early 2024 what you just said about people dying out, I think three or four people that I interviewed for this book died in that time period. So that's really excellent advice about yeah. realizing the interviews might be the easiest part of the whole thing if done correctly. But my last question is, you're a Buffalo guy by origin, and Buffalo is one of the preeminent music cities that people don't realize is a music city because it's Hall of Fame is in the back of a hard rock cafe in Niagara Falls. So I'm curious, do you and your roots of Buffalo music go back to Talis and Billy Sheehan? My my roots in music in, in Buffalo go back to WKBW, which was the clear channel uh, radio station, uh, 50,000 watts uh, and the way the way that it worked is that all these local stations in the in the northeast had a shut down at uh, sundown, so the WKBW would have a clear uh, channel, and uh, it went all the way from Chicago to Nova Scotia down 
to Florida. It was a major, you know, there was a station that was really huge in, in breaking Buddy Holly in 1957, which is the same year I was born, mm -hmm. and, and breaking the Beatles in 1964, which I remember very well, mm -hmm. listening to my little transistor radio. Now, as, as we got into the later 60s, taste got a little bit hipper, and I was listening to uh, WYSL-FM, uh, which later became WPHD. I also listened to Chum coming across uh, the lake from Toronto. Yeah. So as a kid, I wasn't going to see live music, but I was listening to a lot of stuff on the radio. Also, I have to say, we had uh, this woman, you know, this, it, it's almost embarrassing to say, uh, but there was, a, there was an African-American woman who helped raise me. She was uh, domestic help for my family. She lived in our house. Uh, we weren't wealthy, but I guess we were wealthy enough to have domestic help. And I spent a lot of time with her. She was almost like my second mother. And in this, I think I had a similar experience as Michael Bloomfield, because he too had uh, live and help at his house. And I used to hang out in her room and listen to her music on her radio. And she was always on Sundays, always tuned into uh, Reverend Frank Franklin and his gospel music. And during the week, she was listening to Motown and Stax music. So even before I, I got hip to the Beatles in 1964, when they broke in the States, I was listening to, to great uh, soul and rhythm and blues music as a, as a little kid. Got it. I'm glad that story with the Buffalo Roots didn't go. Well, me and Harvey Weinstein started up the company with Brad Gray. And anyway, but Bob. <laughs> I, I did hear a lot of Harvey stories back in the day, but I was a little bit younger. I didn't know him personally. Right. The Buffalo music scene, what, what I'm getting at is very wide reaching between them and Rick James, and the Goo Goo Dolls, yes. et cetera. So hopefully we one day see a Buffalo music scene documentary and you're the guy for it. But in the meantime, congratulations on Made in Chicago. Really Thank looking you. forward to whatever you got coming next in the near future, Bob. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Outro cast.